Thank you very much, Josh. OK, moving across the aisle again then. Our second speaker in opposition tonight is attorney Brenda Feigen. Brenda has been an American feminist leader since the 70s. She was vice president of the National Organization for Women, a founder of Ms. Magazine, and a founder of the ACLU's Women, Women's Rights Project alongside Ruth Bader Ginsburg. A practicing lawyer, she has appeared in the Emmy-winning Oscar-nominated documentary RBG and is depicted in Hulu's Emmy-nominated Mrs. America as one of five famous feminists. It's a great pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you for making the journey. You have the floor. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. I have traveled over uh, almost 6,000 miles to tell you just how fit for purpose the United States Constitution is. <laughs> what the Constitution means to me is the name of the most produced work in America, in, in American theaters this season. It debuted on Broadway in 2017, and now there are at least 16 productions around the country. In the play, a 15-year-old girl debates the merits of the Constitution with the lead actress. Because of the Constitution, citizens in all 50 states, 334 million people in 4 million square miles, understand that our government is based on a written Constitution that is the supreme law of the United States. How do we know the Constitution's purpose? Its preamble sets out the main goals to form a more perfect union, to establish, to establish justice, to promote the general welfare, to secure the blessings of liberty. The Bill of Rights, as we've heard, the first 10 amendments, is what gives the United States its reputation for being the world's leader in civil rights and civil liberties. Let's look at, the Supreme, at how the Supreme Court decisions work to see how the Constitution has been applied and interpreted. The First Amendment's purpose, guarantee of free speech is topmost in many people's minds these days, but not all speech is protected. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes delivered the classic statement in 1919 of the clear and present danger test that accepted certain speech from the protection of the First Amendment. Are the words used in such circumstances of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger? While former President Trump has always employed invective as a political tool, his rhetoric has grown increasingly more menacing he suggested that the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff could have been executed, that shoplifters should be shot, that you ought to go after the state attorney general who is pr prosecuting him. In language evoking Nazi eugenics, he has accused immigrants of poisoning the blood of our country and has called them vermin. The question is how much of this do we have to take before, before Trump is stopped? Recently, the federal judge in the D.C. case against Trump for his role in the January 6, 2021 insurrection ordered him to refrain from rhetoric targeting prosecutors and court personnel and to stop making inflammatory statements about likely witnesses, including his former vice president, Mike Pence. Trump also called special counsel Jack Smith deranged and a radical Obama hack. The judge said this language presents a danger to the administration of justice. Another judge, this time in New York State, fined Donald Trump after his calling the attorney general a disaster and the prosecutor again deranged. He fined him $5,000 first and then another $10,000 in violation of a gag order that has now been placed on Trump's lawyers after the judge cited the deluge of threats and harassment that have inundated his chambers. Jail time for Trump has now been threatened by the judge. Harvard Law professor Larry Tribe has written that the First Amendment doesn't protect witness intimidation, jury tampering, or threats to the presiding judge or the prosecution, and that Trump's statements pose an immediate danger to the targets of his rage and the public at large. Wait. Guess who's siding with Trump, saying he has a First Amendment right to spew his venom? The ACLU, my old organization, has also defended the Nazis' right to march through the town of Skokie. Now a trial is going on in Colorado claiming that the 14th Amendment keeps Trump, who fomented an insurrection after taking the oath of office from being a candidate for president. The mere fact that people are talking about all this means the Constitution is fit for purpose, promoting the general welfare. Moving to another cluster of First Amendment constitutional challenges. 30 years ago, the Supreme Court said that students' First Amendment rights were violated when local school boards removed books simply because they disliked ideas contained in those books. The same constitutional issue arose 
when students in one school district were required to obtain a signed permission slip to, to, get, their, to get the Harry Potter, Potter books out of the library without their parents' consent. The subject of sanitization is, of course, coming up again as a number of schools try to get books that delve into LGBTQ subject matter off the shelves. Before we move away from the First Amendment, consider the protests stemming from the Gaza-Israel war on college campuses today. The question is whether any particular protest is protected speech or whether it presents a clear and present danger. My personal favorite clause in the Constitution is in the 14th Amendment. Neither the United States nor any state may deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. On that point. Yes. How do you square the fact that free speech is protected for college campuses, but um, a member of uh, the House of Representatives, Rashida Tlaib, was recently censored by the House for her criticism of Israel? I'm sorry, for what? How do you square the fact that free speech, as you say, is protected on college campuses, but not in the House of Representatives, where Rashida Tlaib was censored by her colleagues for criticism of Israel? She was subject to that kind of criticism after a lot of conversation before it. It wasn't the first instance of it. Okay. Now, the right, that right to equal protection that I'm talking about in the 14th Amendment comes with the obvious question, equal to whom? The black children in Kansas were reassured by a unanimous Supreme Court that their education not only had to be equal to that afforded whites, but to be equal, it, it had to be separate. It could not be separate. In 1967, the Lovings, one of whom was black, the other white, were granted the privilege of marriage by the court that said that Virginia's refusal to allow their, e their mixed marriage violated their 14th Amendment equal protection rights. It took another 48 years for same-sex couples to be granted the right to marry like millions of straight couples. During the oral argument, now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg scornfully observed that civil unions were really skim milk marriages. Petitioner's claim was that reserving marriage for heterosexuals was a violation of the Constitution's equal protection guarantees. A majority of the court agreed, demonstrating again that the Constitution is indeed fit for purpose. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment has banned sex discrimination too, starting with the Supreme Court cases handled by my friend and then colleague, Professor Ginsburg. The mother of a deceased child should be considered equally suited to, the, to administer her son's, her son's estate, eliminating an Idaho presumption in favor of fathers. Young men in Colorado must be allowed to buy beer with the same, same higher alcohol content as women. In another case, we argued that the husband of a female Air Force lieutenant must be provided the same housing and medical benefits as those afforded wives of male officers. I was at the Supreme Court counsel table with Professor Ginsburg when she made her first oral argument. We won eight to one, but the court did not yet rule that sex discrimination cases should be scrutinized as closely as race discrimination, the standard we had asked for. 20 years later, shortly after now Justice Ginsburg assumed her seat on the Supreme Court, writing for the majority, she articulated the 14th Amendment's high standard of review that applies today to sex discrimination cases. There has to be an exceedingly persuasive reason for any distinction based on sex to survive equal protection clause scrutiny. With her majority opinion, the all-male Virginia Military Academy failed that test and girls were immediately admitted. When it came to contraception and abortion, the Constitution's mandate got fuzzier. The 1965 case challenging a Connecticut law that banned the use of birth control by married couples, Justice D Douglas, writing for the majority, struck down that law, finding a right to privacy impl implicit in the penumbras of the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, as well as its guarantee of liberty. A few years later, the court, in a case that arose from Massachusetts law, extended the right to unmarried couples on equal protection grounds. Next up. If the right to privacy extended to the bedroom, reformers reasoned, it should also extend to a woman's control of her own body. And eight years later, the right of women to have abortions was granted with some limitations in Roe v. Wade. Justice Blackmun, writing for the majority, concluded that as a constitutional matter, the right to privacy was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. So, yes. When these came to join other Western countries brought in, are not made by the American Parliament, 
but are maybe said by a court? And does that show that the constitutional environment and framework that's actually conducive to making the process through democracy in a directly elected way? I think I understand your question. So it was 50 years ago that Professor Ginsburg first expressed her concern to me. The court in Roe should have decided that denying women the right to terminate pregnancies was a denial of equal protection mandated by the Constitution's 14th Amendment. That since men could do whatever they wanted to their bodies, so should women have the same autonomy over theirs, including the right to have abortions. Now, as you know, we have women all over the United States haunted by the recent majority opinion in Dobbs against Jackson Women's Health that overturned Roe. Today, each state's law determines whether women who live in that state may obtain abortions and whether doctors there will be able to render medical treatment in connection with those abortions. Yay to the women of Ohio, who just in one week ago, or nine days ago, got an amendment protecting abortion into their constitution. Personally, I feel strongly that there should be no limits whatsoever on women's ability to decide whether or not or when to have abortions. Being forced to abandon the constitutional protection we've had for 50 years, we now have much political and legislative work that needs to be done to fix this mess. Finally, to address some of the points that have been raised, understand that without the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, black men might still not be voting. Without the 19th Amendment, no women would. And without the 26th Amendment, you'd have to be over 21 to vote. No, thank you. As I've said, the purpose of the Constitution set out in its preamble is to form a more perfect union. The cases and the amendments I've just described are some of the tools the United States Constitution gives us to do that admittedly hard work of making our country better. Therefore, the United States Constitution, though not perfect, is fit for purpose. Thank you.